Chloe's a photo photographic artist. She's also a filmmaker based in the United Kingdom. Her work is internationally recognized and has been exhibited at the Tate Modern, the Irish Museum of Modern Art, and in Dresden. It's been published in newspapers and magazines such as The Guardian, Sunday Times, Harper's, and Le Monde. Her awards include the British Journal of Photography International Photography Award and the Royal Photographic Society Vic Odin Award, as, as well as the prestigious Robert Gardner Fellowship. Chloe's first monograph, called Shot at Dawn, was published in 2014. In 2018, she published two books, one, In Search of Frankenstein, with Kadoji Press, and Caspian, The Elements, with Aperture and the Peabody Museum Press. And, and those will be available, uh, the book will be available um, to, to you today. Um, the Caspian book and the exhibition, which we will preview tonight, are the culmination of five years' work in the region that Chloe undertook, much of this facilitated by the 2014 Robert Gardner Fellowship in Photography. And this is her first solo e exhibition in the United States. She will be speaking today with Makita Best, who is the Richard L. Menschel Curator of Photography at the Harvard Art Museums. And please join me in welcoming them to the stage for their conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. It's wonderful to see everyone here today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I think that maybe we can start by, I mean, I think that one of the things that really fascinates me about your work is the way in which the, you are exploring the human condition to draw on what um, Lisa was just saying, but the landscape is also a, very, a central element. Um, and maybe you could talk, take us into this process of creating, creating Caspian and your kind of work to balance uh, these explorations. Yeah, I think what I'm really interested in is this relationship between people and landscape and you know the effect we have on the landscapes around us but also what we project onto the landscape what we see in the landscape so with this project um caspian the elements here um i've got some previews of the book and we'll also then go into just the the photographs themselves and um, you know i ended up spending a lot of time in this region uh kazakhstan azerbaijan uh, Russia, Iran, and Turkmenistan. And I ended up using these materials, or elements as I called them, as my guides through the region. So they, they, they ended up creating a kind of narrative um, or a way of, 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 of finding stories that related to humans and, and their environment. So um, does that answer your mm -hmm. question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I started 2010. I went um, hitchhiking with my boyfriend um, from Western China back to Britain. It took 10 months. We were camping, staying with, um, you know, couch surfing, staying with locals, staying wherever we could. And really the whole agenda for that first trip was to research by experience. So rather than the sort of classic idea of the photojournalist who comes from um, the West and um, perhaps researches something on the internet, finds a story that someone else has written about, maybe even someone else has photographed before, and the idea of just going over there, photographing that same story, coming back, and then trying to publish it. I was trying to react against that and go with very little knowledge in that first trip and really just experience the place, talk to as many people as possible and see what I found. Mm -hmm. So that was the kind of original basis or sort of way of moving through the region, which then, you know, you'll see in other projects that I've done, is kind of the opposite. It's very research heavy. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, that was my chosen form of research, was, was transitioning from east to west on land. No planes, no, no um, you know, airborne travel, just experiencing that cultural shift and trying to find meaningful stories along the way. Mm -hmm. So over five years, I mean, that's a, that's a lengthy bit of time. How did the story change for you? You're, you're, you know, you're saying you're learning by experience and not by mm -hmm. research. So mm -hmm. did you initially come with, OK, this might be what the story is? And then how mm -hmm. did it actually evolve? Could you explain the photographs that we're seeing while you're talking? 
Yeah, so... Um, well, I won't refer to them the whole time because I think hopefully it's more interesting if we actually have a bit of a discussion. But, um, for example, um, in relation to your question, you know, I first came to the region, I'm showing you the first story, in fact, that I photographed, which was a place called Naftalan, which is in Azerbaijan. Um, it's a small sanatorium town where people bathe in crude oil as a health remedy. And um, they've been doing this since at least the 13th century because I found um, you know, documentation in Marco Polo's diaries talking about people bathing their camel for the itch and the scab. So people used it as um, a kind of healing ointment for either skin or bone diseases. So when I first arrived in the region, I was so aware of the oil and gas, you know, particularly in, I was in Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan at the beginning around the Caspian Sea. Mm -hmm. And so in answer to your question how that changed, at first my, my question to myself was, how can I make interesting and different work about these very well-known kind of industrial uh, substances that, um, you know, define this area? And, you know, so I was looking for these more unusual subjects, um, perhaps stories that might make you think a little bit more about your preconceptions about the subject. So from, from my perspective, um, a 36-year-old Londoner, um, you know, when I think of uh, crude oil, I think of heavy industry, uh, power, global trade, corruption, huge wealth. So therefore, to see people bathing in crude oil as a health remedy was extraordinary and actually a really mind-opening moment for me. This um, is all the crutches that were left, um, supposedly after this miracle cure. They know it yeah. as the miracle oil. So yeah. these crutches have been left behind as a kind of symbolic, um, as a symbol of, of, of this um, um, wonderful cure. Mm -hmm. um, then another project that I did quite soon, soon after um, in Kazakhstan was I had seen, we were hitchhiking along the coast and we were really, um, we were in, in the car with this Dutch oil worker and chatting away and suddenly out of the corner of my eye, I caught this, this vision really, this, this, this extraordinary landscape which was this very, very, very elaborate, beautiful mausoleum um, in, a, in a quite basic um, graveyard and then all these cabins that were next door to it. And um, I went in um, actually many days later because we couldn't stop at the time, but it, this, this image kind of stayed in my mind and I knew I wanted to return. Mm -hmm. And when I returned there, I found um, this set of Uzbek migrant workers who were all living in the cemetery and building these very elaborate, beautiful um, mausoleums. And what I was really interested to discover was that these mausoleums were of a kind of new style. There was a new taste um, in this area of Kazakhstan for a much more kind of almost glitzy, showy mausoleum. And that was partly to do with the oil wealth in this area. So, for example, here you can see actually etched onto the side of some of these mausoleums were the symbols of um, the oil industry. So yeah. actually, you know, emblazoned into these monuments to the dead were these symbols and I again so these these were these first kind of two stories mm -hmm. that made me feel like I was beginning to find a language or a way of communicating perhaps about these materials these elements these natural resources mm -hmm. but hopefully in a slightly different way mm -hmm. for people who aren't familiar with the they may not read the book yet or seen the mm -hmm. exhibition obviously it's not open but can you just give us the arc of the story that you're telling the kind of some main um, images that, that's, that are telling the story for you. Yeah, so in the book, um, we decided to section it up into three, three chapters. Uh, the first chapter is oil, gas, and fire. You're seeing images from, from that series here. Here in Baku, these are the flame towers, which are lit up at night, so they actually mimic flames. Um, again, you know, the country kind of... Um, you know, defining itself in terms of this oil and gas. Um, but then as the book moves on, um, then you get to a section called rock, um, uranium, and salt. 
Um, and then the third section is water. So, so we created a kind of um, way of segmenting up the photographs, but also creating a kind of rhythm. And I really, particularly in this project, am very keen not to see it in terms of geography, uh, in terms of this is Iran, this is Kazakhstan, okay. but again, reading it in terms of materials and landscapes. Mm -hmm. So that's why I sectioned it up in these chapters, um, so sort of non-geographical, um, but more of a sort of geological um, way of bringing together stories. Which is itself a trope, you know, this sort of emphasis on this, you're now, you're in this country, and here's the, the type or the, mm. the look. You're, you're subverting that through these mm. images. Mm. Can you talk about your approach to photographing? Because I've been struck by how each of your images is very different. Like, mm -hmm. There's no one image of yours. You're, gonna, you're really adopting a very different uh, visual language mm -hmm. as you explore each subject mm -hmm. that you're photographing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think I, um, particularly in this series, um, <clears throat> was very loose in the way... I, I suppose I was... In some ways, I was... I, I would only photograph in certain lights um, to bring a kind of visual coherence together. Mm -hmm. But equally, I was keen to be able to photograph all sorts of environments and not um, restrict myself from, um, you know, taking photographs of certain people in certain... Um, places by having too formal a, an, an approach, I suppose. Okay. So, um, you know, as I said, it's over five years um, going back and forth. I wasn't out there for all five years. I'd go for a month, come back for two months, go out for another month. Um, and so I suppose actually I changed as well during that five years. Okay. And that was one of the challenges making this book was, um, you know, when I first started shooting, I was one person creatively. And then I was a slightly different person, more or less the same, but also exploring different ideas. So, so that was a kind of challenge, how to bring it all together, but I'm really pleased with what, what we achieved. Can you go back for a moment to that mm -hmm. image of the house and the fire? Can you just take us into this choice? So, so both, both <laughs> photographs... Um, this is a group discussion. <laughs> yeah, both, both photographs are to do with Zoroastrian faith. Um, the photograph of the woman um, getting married. Um, this is in a Zoroastrian temple in Iran, um, one of the very few Zoroastrian temples that still exist in Iran because um, the Islamic authority um, try to keep it, keep it to, the, to a minimum. And so this is a rare case where the lady has her hair uncovered. She's getting married. Behind her is the um, everlasting fire, which you can't see in that kind of area behind her. So she, um, because as I said, this section is about oil, gas, fire. So a sort of connection, a, a, a ritualistic, spiritual connection to fire. Um, and these, this photograph is Shashan Beshudi, which is the um, uh, two days before Nowruz, the New Year, um, Iranian New Year. Um, when people jump over seven fires as a kind of purification rite. And so they set up these um, seven fires in the street. But increasingly, the authorities are um, stopping these rituals, making people do them indoors in their own yards. So I was very lucky um, to be able to photograph this in Ramsar um, before it was put to, put to an end. So this is a, a, a kind of a, a technique that you're doing, telling the story, like these kind of little chapters of uh, rituals, um, mm. um, ceremonies. Mm -hmm. um, can you? T what about something like this or these ones that follow? How are these also kind of thematic in a certain way? Mm. Ways of you tell this story. Mm. Well, this is within the salt uh, uranium and uh, what did I say? Salt uranium and rock section, and this is also in Iran. Um, an area which has the highest naturally occurring radiation in the whole world. And so what I was really interested in in this area was that there was a lot of these, these baths, so they were kind of thermal spas, but actually part of the kind of healing process is accredited to this very high naturally occurring radiation, which who knows if that's the case or not, but within the stone, within the rocks um, that these, these buildings were built with, um, you know, they are said to be very, um, they are said to kind of hold some of this radiation. So it's whether, whether 
I suppose always there's an interesting idea in kind of healing and belief and how much is fact and how much is not. But um, it's certainly true to say that, um, that it, it is the highest um, naturally occurring radiation in the world. So it's quite an extraordinary place. Mm -hmm. And you're really showing us how this is all interwoven, people's lives, mm. their rituals, the landscape, and then the kind of paradoxical relationship with these elements mm. um, that are poisonous or, or harmful in some, in some yeah. cases, but yet, or even the industry is harmful, but yet so integral to their existence. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with the whole series, there are you know, moments of beauty and poetry and harmony between people and landscape. But there's also, um, you know, more difficult moments and, you know, scarred landscapes and my, you know, questioning or noticing of obviously the environmental impact um, of our relationship to this landscape. So, for example, this photograph um, is an area, um, I think it's 20 kilometers from uh, the Caspian Sea, which obviously was once um, part of the sea and is now a dried up um, bed with some uh, boats left over. Wow. And again, this is, was once underneath the Caspian Sea many, many years before. How do these images for you represent this revolu evolution that you referenced earlier? Um, their evolution in terms of thinking about this space? Like, are there images now that you look back on and you're, you're kind of made first or early? Does that exist at all in this project? Or are they all um, really made at a time for you when you really understood what you were pursuing? Um, it's, it's quite hard to say. I think, um, I think now, because as Lisa mentioned, you know, I finished shooting in 2015. So in a sense... I've had two years to digest the work, edit it, reform it, rethink it, then work um, with Kate and Brendan to make the book. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's been many moments of kind of shifting around and taking out certain parts. So in a sense, the last three years has been kind of thinking and, and reconfiguring. And so now it all kind of sits quite well for me together, mm -hmm. even though when I was making it, it always feels a very sort of difficult um, experience because you're, you're kind of battling with what you're trying to, um, what you're trying to say and what you're actually taking, which pictures you're actually making um, and whether that's doing what you're trying to achieve. So I'd say that was the much more difficult process. And now um, I'm at a nice moment of having kind of completed things and <clears throat> having put the show up upstairs. So there, there feels like there's some sort of calm around it now, whereas there was kind of less so before. Is there a, maybe you could talk about this for a second before I ask a little bit about what's going on in this image? Yeah, so this is a photograph in, in Turkmenistan. Um, and here um, we have the transport minister up um, on the photograph. Um, and this is in a lobby in Awaza, which is one of the um, new kind of almost beach resorts that they call the new uh, Turkmen Las Vegas. Um, and uh, this is, yeah, the lobby uh, of one of the hotels that's very much reaching out to a sort of European audience um, and trying to kind of change the image of Turkmenistan in that one area, whereas other areas less so. And what is your, I mean, that kind of interior image, um, the one of the wedding, what is your relationship as you enter into these spaces? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how does your own approach work in terms of, of establishing kind of context here? Because everyone is, you know, they're all different scenes. I mean, it's not as if you're staying with one person here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so tell us a little about your approach to yeah. making these images, to working with subjects. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it really varies because you'll see some certain photographs are just observed. Mm -hmm. The people in the photograph wouldn't have known I was taking the photograph. Other photographs, when there's someone who kind of takes primary focus in the photograph, I would speak to, um, in some cases, have a continued relationship with that person. Other times, not so much. For example, in the oil bathing images, um, you know, they... Um, because they were very, um, they were more kind of sensitive in terms of photographing within a kind of more private environment. Um, I went to the sanatorium, spoke to the, um, the head of the sanatorium, explained what I was doing. 
he agreed to it, and then we'd go and talk to each person. And in that case, I had a translator, um, meaning that I could speak, um, that person could speak um, in Azerbaijani um, to each person. Whereas otherwise, I speak a bit of Russian and was kind of, you know, making my way around speaking, you know, a certain amount of the language um, um, in other cases. So, so it was actually quite, it, it, it varies a lot, my relationship with the people. And, you know, sometimes you really want a connection and, and, uh, and a, a conversation and you want to understand what that person's doing and why they're there. And that totally shifts, for example, the guys in the cemetery I wouldn't have taken those photographs if I didn't know what they were doing there, you know. Um, that's what makes it interesting to me. But in a few other cases, um, for example, um, you know, well, these guys, I, I actually did chat to them briefly, but, you know, often it's more, I already know, they're bathing because it's Epiphany. So they, on, on the day of the Epiphany, the Russian Orthodox priest goes down to the water and decrees that this water is now healing for today and you can bathe yourself, immerse yourself three times, you won't get ill and you'll purify yourself for the year ahead. So that's why I went down that day and I already understood the significance of what they were doing um, and then made the photograph. So. You spoke earlier about you know this project as something making an image that's very different about this place and about mm -hmm. these people. Um, were there photographs that you were looking at, or that you you said you, it wasn't a research-based project, mm -hmm. but just in your mind, or mm -hmm. was, it, was there something that you were working against, or kind of working in reference to, as you produced these images? Um, I think that although I went as I said, the first trip without doing any research. Then as I came back, then I did do research as I was going along because I, I felt that was important to once I'd find out about something going on or someone would talk about, for example, the oil bathing again, then I wanted to research to actually find out what the history of it was, etc. So well, the experience so, led your path of research. Exactly. So the path, so hopefully that idea of sort of keeping your options entirely open at the beginning hopefully made me receptive to things that I wouldn't otherwise have been receptive to because I would have been too busy trying to photograph the one thing that I had come to photograph, you know. Um, but then um, I did research as I went along. Um, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We may be... Oh, yeah. So this is a photograph of the mixing of um, oil and water at the water's edge of Baku, just looking, looking down onto the water, seeing this kind of wonderful marbling of the oil and water. And, you know, in, in the series, I think, hopefully there's these moments of, of kind of being able to really, you know, indulge in the beauty of, of these materials um, around us. Um, and hopefully you'll see in the exhibition, if you come um, upstairs, you know, we've got these large murals on the walls, which, which hopefully, you know, it's a moment to kind of, to, to immerse yourself, as I said, in the beauty and to kind of think about the, the allure of these materials. Because I think a lot of this project is about why people are drawn to certain materials to then perform their daily rituals, their spiritual beliefs. You know, what is it that kind of, what is it that entices us? But then also, what is it that we, we are able to then, like classically with water, project upon? You know, it's, the, it's wonderfully reflective and kind of empty and endless that you can then project everything you want to onto this wonderful substance. Can you talk a little bit about the transition from you know, print. I mean, it's so odd to see these so large after having, you know, only had the book to look mm -hmm. at. Um, but the book is also an object in and of itself. I mean, mm -hmm. it really is a piece of art. Mm. Um, can you talk about that, making that transition from the, the print into this other form? Yeah, I think what I really, really enjoy in the process of making work is these different sort of outcomes that you can 
um, create, you know. So you, you collect this material, you're shooting all of this work, you're looking at the contact sheets. I photograph on film, so I get these contact sheets back, sometimes many months after I've photographed them. And then you pour through and you make these selections. But then when you think about a book and then you think about a show or you think about a web, an online gallery, you know, each one does something totally different. And I think there's real joy in appreciating each form as its own thing and not trying to just replicate, do the kind of book of the show, of the, you know, that you just treat each one completely differently. And that's, that's a really kind of exciting prospect. So with this book, as, as, as we said, you know, there's, there's, um, we've been able to use these, these lovely textures through the book like wonderful paper, um, some larger pictures, smaller. Then we have interlaced these different texts, three different texts that we commissioned, which are all kind of coming at things from a slightly different angle. So it's an opportunity in a book to, to bring a lot of material together, which sometimes in an exhibition you can't bring so much in there. So, so that's, that's the challenge, actually, how to create complexity without overloading things, you know? And, and the freedom. And the yeah, freedom, yeah, yeah. And in fact, we, maybe we'll look at we the next project to, shot at dawn. Uh -huh. Yeah. Sorry, that's a pixelated image, but you can get a sense. Yeah. So you told me a wonderful story about how um, this project originated. Maybe you could tell us, tell the audience first what it's about, and then mm -hmm. how you kind of came into this topic. Yeah. So this project I made um, um, in between 2012, 2014. So in a sense, it was around the time I was making the Caspian project, but I was focusing um, on this subject of the shot at dawn, people who were executed for cowardice and desertion in World War I by the French, um, um, British, German, and Belgian forces. So all the forces on the, on, on the Western Front. And... It came as a commission from Oxford University. It was a very open brief. I wasn't quite sure whether it was something I wanted to take on because it felt like I was unsure what my contribution to the subject of World War I could be. Um, however, I went out and I did a first kind of recce. I went out, did a research trip, wandered around all the graveyards and the battlefields and met with, with a couple of people. And one of the people that I met with was a guy called Pete Heelans, who's the head of In Flanders Fields Museum, which if any of you ever go to um, Ypres in, um, in Belgium, it's a really wonderful museum to go to. And it just so happened that his specialist subject was shot at dawn. So I was very lucky when I stumbled across this subject, which already I was questioning, why don't I know about this kind of subplot of the um, First World War? And it turned out that, you know, all of the archives were closed until 1991 because the government didn't want these, these archives, these documents to be explored because it was a, a blot on the national conscience that we had executed our own troops um, for cowardice mm -hmm. and desertion, which could mean all sorts of things. Obviously, at the time, PTSD, as it's called now, shot at dawn, I mean, um, shell shock then, um, moments of, of um, could you call it weakness, self-questioning, who knows? Anyway, my, I met with Pete and he told me this story which really was an important way, um, it, was in, it was the reason really I made the project and he, he was doing research on the subject himself and he met with um, Fermin Cease, a farmer who lived locally, who was nine, in his late 90s and he was talking about the experience of living in a house where someone had been executed um, for cowardice in World War I. And what was really interesting was that he was brought to tears talking about this dark cloud that had been cast over his family upbringing, this territory, um, you know, his youth. And yet, he wasn't actually born yet when the execution had happened. It happened two years before he was born. However, the impact of this event on the landscape and the domestic landscape had been completely transformative for him. And it was really talking about that that it made me think again about this idea of how we project onto landscape, how we receive history in relation to landscape. And so I therefore realized that you know, this, this challenge that was put to me 
how to make work about World War I that I was not sure whether I would take on, I suddenly realised that it was in landscape. It was about the relationship with landscape. When all these people are long, long gone, um, at least if I could find the places where they had been executed, um, that that was, that was a way into these stories. So, so I spent two years working with battlefield guides, um, academics, military historians, all sorts of people to try and find these locations. That was part of, that was the huge part of the project. Google Maps. Sorry? Google Maps. <laughs> Google Maps, yeah. So the last one I was telling um, Makeda that um, this one, so we had a document that was a letter, an eyewitness letter saying these people were executed at the end of the garden against three trees. But of course, when I went to the place, there were no three trees anymore. So then we had to look at the aerial maps of the, um, of the area from 1914 and then put them over Google Maps now to work out where it would be. And that's just one case. Each case was completely different. And so for me, it was about photographing these absent landscapes, these spaces where something had happened, um, and really using the text as well, these, these titles, these locations, time and date of death, as a way of, of helping you into um, what has happened there. So they're always exhibited with, with these titles okay. um, so that you can kind of understand what, what has happened there. And I think what, what became really interesting to me was the idea that perhaps we've seen so many photographs of executions, World War I, battlefields, conflict, that actually maybe you don't need to see that. Yeah to be able to understand to some degree. And that if you're presented with this information and then with the landscape, that actually your mind kind of fills in the gaps. Mm -hmm. But yet hopefully you, there's enough space in the image that you can also allow your mind to breathe and think and kind of move rather than being having an extremely specific example of an execution being presented to you, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It's so interesting how the text is almost like its own picture. Yeah, and absolutely. And then the picture is a picture, but you yeah. imagine just looking at this and reading mm -hmm. all of this, you kind of imagine the lives and the time, mm. and, you know, what that what was like. And then you look at the image and you have other kinds of mm. imaginings about what that space is and yeah. who lives there and how it has changed over time. Mm. Mm. And I think that when you're talking also about the photograph in the gallery as opposed to the photograph in the book, I think what, what really worked well for me with this series was having a large photograph where you actually, it becomes a space to con contemplate. Mm -hmm. it, because it's fairly large and you, you stand close to it and you look into it, you're, you, it, it, it becomes, yeah, a space of contemplation, mm -hmm. um, which will give in certain amounts of information which, which guide you into one thought process, but also it can become something else too. So as you say, people then bring to it their experiences, their parents, their you know, grandparents who might have been in World War I, their experiences. So, so hopefully it, it, it can, your response to it can grow um, further than also that, that, that one person's experience. And is there a time, are you also going at the exact time? Yeah. It's interesting because you look at the grid and without you saying that, you kind of start to make comparisons and you're like this is all happening at one time yeah yeah right? well supposedly it was happening it was all at dawn mm -hmm. and part of the reason for that that it was it was a way of of imprinting into people's brains before the day of war was was begun mm -hmm. you know whereas somehow if it happens at the end of the day you go to sleep and things start up again yeah. in a different sort of mental space mm -hmm. whereas this really was a way of, you know, and in the French cases, for example, they, they brought four or five people who had deserted together, mm -hmm. even though they hadn't deserted at the same time, mm -hmm. and they executed them together mm -hmm. in order to create a bigger show. Mm -hmm. And they would have 2,000 troops walking past them yeah. um, so that they would be seeing this, and it would be saying, do not do this yourself. This is, this is, a, this is a warning, yeah. <laughs> And the captions, the captions do have the time, is that right? Absolutely, yes. yeah. yeah. The time, the date, the, the place. The precision is so fascinating compared to the other project. Yeah. I mean, this is so exact. Yeah, yeah. And the other projects in which you're kind of wandering and, 
and there's a consistency of kind of tone, mm -hmm. but here there is this kind of same kind of place, and then yeah. the kind of staccato function of mm -hmm. these uh, texts, mm. right? There's kind of a different rhythm yeah. there. And I think partly that was, you know, making one body of work which satisfies you creatively in one way, but also you, you know, I was feeling like I wanted to do something a bit different. And also I felt like there was a real responsibility um, in these cases of people who had been executed um, that I almost felt, felt the need to do something in a very specific but also detached way because it was, you know, these people's histories who had been misremembered mm -hmm. um, in such a terrible way. These people hadn't been included on any of the graves mm -hmm. um, or the monuments um, mm. that, 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 that the, the various countries had, had created. So, so for me, it was important to be very specific, but also slightly detached, if you know what I mean. Have you, I mean, there's such a, we're in a moment now of, mm. you know, remembering. Mm. Have you had, had any contact with any descendants you know, heard about this or seen the name of the relative and mm. contacted you? Well, what's been really frustrating is that I have had quite a few people contacting me uh -huh. because they've been aware of the project saying my descendant was um, executed. Did you include them in your project or oh. did you find out research? Oh. And unfortunately yeah. never did the two meet up mm. because although, so I photographed 75 cases, um, that was of 1,000. Mm -hmm. Um, and, yeah, and that was all I could find of the actual locations. Because often in the, all these documentation, you get lots of information, but you just can't find the exact location. So that's been a frustration because I think that there was a, you know, that there was a moment at which people had hope, hope for some answers. A yearning. Yeah, yeah for, for absolutely. You have located some. Yeah, stuff. and I think what's been also fascinating about the project is that the knowledge of how the audience have changed over 100 years. So that same information, to present that same information about those people to a broad audience, you know, they were seen as cowards, deserters. So some people felt uncomfortable about that, but it was kind of the given um, way of, um, of, of terming these people. Whereas nowadays, you know, for, for the most part, people see these people as victims of modern warfare. Right. So, so that's really interesting, presenting the same information 100 years later, and the reception is totally different. Well, especially since you said that they would do this at a particular time so that people would have to see it. Yeah. And now you have people walking by um, with other kind of sympathies toward mm. you know, a victim that they can't even see. They're just looking at basically yeah. a memorial. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. an absent memorial, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. And so... So this There's, is your most recent project. This is my most recent project. Extraordinary um, book. Um. Yeah, so this is called In Search of Frankenstein. And um, it came out of a residency that I did in Switzerland. Um, I was invited to work out in Verbier, um, in the Alps in Switzerland. And my first port of call was to do some research into the, into the, um, <clears throat> the landscape, significant moments in history. Um, and I was fascinated to find out um, about the year without summer, 1816, where it had been, uh, there, there was a volcano that exploded in Indonesia and created this fine dust that ca carried all the way around the world and created this kind of blanket um, shielding the sun from reaching the earth and meaning there was this incessant rain, terrible, terrible, terrible weather that meant that, you know, people were, were starving, in fact, because there was crop failure, there was mass migration. It was almost like this kind of apocalyptic moment. Yeah. Um, and at that time, this had various effects on this landscape and the glaciers nearby. But I was fascinated to find out that Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, uh, Lord Byron, and their cohort of um, romantic poets were all staying just by the shores of Lake Geneva. And they were trying to have a summer holiday wanting to go for lovely kind of boating trips and things, but they were kept indoors day after day. And so Lord Byron set them a challenge. He said, okay, everyone needs to write a ghost story. Um, you know, get to it. And they all got to it except for <clears throat> Mary Shelley, who was 18 um, years of age. And she, you know, was racking her brains, thinking, what could I do? And a few days later, she lay down to sleep at night and she closed her eyes 
and she saw these images, these dreadful, dreadful, dreadful images, and she saw the story of Frankenstein. She woke up and she told her soon-to-be husband, I, I have seen the most horrific visions yeah. and, you know, oh, if only I could write a ghost story as good as that. And he said, well, that's your ghost story. And so she set, set about writing it. And I was really interested to, to read about this and then to take this copy of Brad Frankenstein that I had with me up into the mountains. And I couldn't help but read the, the sort of glacial environment, the climate change, the glacial melt, you know, in terms of this kind of story of man messing with nature and, um, you know, human folly, I suppose, kind of, um, unraveling um, and with all its effects in terms of the landscape. So, for example, this is the Mer de Glace. Um, this is where Mary Shelley sets um, the famous scene where Victor Frankenstein, the scientist, goes up to the mountain, to the glacier, to try and f find some form of respite. He's just, he's racked with guilt of having created this monster. The monster's run away. He's, he's you know in this terrible, terrible state. So he goes up into the beautiful natural environment to try and have some sort of calm moment. And then suddenly he sees this figure running across the mountains at superhuman speed. And it's the monster. And this is all set here in the Mer de Glace, which is this famous spot, which, you know, they talk about the beauty of these um, waves of ice and these glorious crevices. But in fact, when you go nowadays, you know, it used to be up to here, the ice. Yeah. Now it looks like this sort of smear yeah. um, on the landscape. It's like a motorway through the landscape. Yeah. Um, and so the project evolved to be photographing these, these yeah, scarred landscapes, these, these melted um, glacial landscapes, but then also these extraordinary, extraordinary interior landscapes that I discovered when I was out there. Um, someone mentioned the bunkers, and I said, what are the bunkers? And it turns out, something that many of you will know, um, there's enough nuclear bunkers in Switzerland for the whole country to go underground in case of nuclear disaster. And that, again, felt like, I mean, the epitome of the Frankensteinian kind of model of, um, you know, people messing with science, hubris, um, the ethics, the ethics around science as well. Um, and so I was, I was interested to then photograph these interior spaces, um, all of which, you know, you've got the showers, uh, the hospital, um, all of these um, beds, uh, dorms. Um, and I brought those photographs together with the exterior spaces and was very, very lucky um, to be able to then use the um, manuscript of Frankenstein. So I went to the Bodleian in, um, in Oxford um, where they have the original Geneva notebook. So that's the notebook which Mary Shelley bought on the shores of Lake Geneva and she, she wrote half of Frankenstein before then she went back to England and wrote the second half. Um, and so I was very lucky um, to be granted access and reproduction rights to, to, to reproduce the whole of the manuscript. Um, the, of, um, here we have, sorry, this is again slightly pixelated, but this was kind of wonderful, the experience of what a manuscript actually is, um, a disbound, um, kind of put on acid-free paper in effectively lab conditions, you know, which all of you who work in kind of museums know that that's how these things are. They're not on a dusty shelf somewhere. But um, I was completely entranced by this by this spidery, beautiful, energetic 18-year-old's writing. Yeah. And so I was delighted to be able to then use it in the book, which you can see here. I, I then interspersed my photographs, overlaying. So some parts of the manuscript are revealed, other parts are obscured um, to create this book called um, In Search of Frankenstein. We're probably mm. Yeah, I think we should uh, yeah. open it up for some questions now. Mm.